My name is John Harmelt. My mother and father were born in this Wenatchee Valley. I was born here and still live here. This country is just like my mother. From this land I receive food from my own tribe. The Wenatchapam River is just like my mother. I get my salmon out of there and have good food. Just the same as my father and my mother raised me as a child. That is the way I am raised by this country. Our Wenatchee Reservation was taken from us in 1894. Our fishing and hunting rights were also taken at that time against our wishes. Many of our tribesmen are scattered in various parts of Washington State where the land is poor. With the approach of old age, it makes it impossible for us to make a livelihood. We, the Wenatchee Indians, wish to have our fishing and hunting rights restored to us in the Wenatchee Valley and Forests, state of Washington. My great-grandfather is buried here at this cemetery. That's mainly why we come down here every year, because we have a lot of relations that are buried in this cemetery. John Harmelt was the last chief of the Wenatchee Indians. He once said he would never leave his old hunting grounds. When my mother and father were here, they were always worried who was going to take care of the cemetery when they left. And and now the worries are passed down to us and we see our children doing the same thing. When we come back down here, it kind of uh, reminds us where our roots are at. When you come down here, it's kind of hard not to shed a few tears. Our mother told us that we needed to start taking care of the, the, the sacred places where our ancestors were buried. Celia Ann Dick was only two years old when her mother died and she went to live with her grandfather, John Harmelt, and his wife Ellen. She knew of her grandfather's struggle to gain recognition of the Wenatchee's right to their reservation. She passed that fight on to her own children when she died in 1997. They made her a promise to right the wrong that was done to the tribe. It's, it's important that we have our hunting and fishing rights back. Why did we lose it in the first place? Who said we lost it? And I think that to come back down here and to actually see our men fishing again, it, I mean, it, it just brings something to the heart that you can't describe it. If you look at the history of most tribes, you can see that the United States or, or non-Indians took advantage of the tribes. Wenatchee is different in the sense, uh, different from, from many tribes, in the sense that it had a treaty that was ratified by the United States. 
And when the United States didn't abide by the terms of that treaty, it had again an agreement which was ratified by the United States. This is an unusual and I think an, a unique instance where the United States is twice, the Congress and the President, the whole body of politic of the country have promised to provide uh, certain things to the tribe and have failed to do that. The Wenatchee River was once said to be so thick with salmon that it ran the color of red. Tumbling down the eastern slope of the Cascade Mountains, it met up with this creek, the Icicle, and together the two rivers formed what was called the Wenatchapam fishery. For centuries, the Wenatchee Indians fished the waters, hunted in the hills, and dug roots in the prairie. The abundant harvest made the Wenatchapam fishery a gathering place for tribes from throughout the region, and trade and intermarriage were common with the Entiat, Chelan, Metau, Kittitas, and Moses Columbia. In 1853, the governor of the territory of Washington, Isaac Stevens, was commissioned to do a survey of a railroad route through the Wenatchapam. Although the Wenatchees were opposed to the trespassing of whites, like other tribes across America facing similar circumstances, they realized the only way to protect their homeland was to agree to a treaty. In 1855, such a treaty was signed, and in it, the Wenatchee Indians were promised a six square mile tract of land, the Wenatchapam fishery. But in the decades that followed, the government failed in its obligation to survey the reservation and preserve it from the public domain. As more whites moved into the Wenatchee Valley, as the railroad inched closer to their land, the Wenatchees watched helplessly as their ancestral homes slipped from their hands. Today, the only Indians allowed to fish freely on the Icicle River, which runs through the heart of the Wenatchee's aboriginal land, are the members of the Yakima tribe. How another tribe came to be allowed to fish on this land while the Wenatchees were denied their rights is also part of the tribe's struggle. We're, we're trying to reestablish our right to hunt and fish and gather in all our usual and accustomed places. That was guaranteed to us in the 1855 treaty and, uh, and the subsequent 1894 agreement with them. The Wenatchee's name for themselves was Piscuausa, and it means narrow canyon. Uh, the name Wenatchee comes from water rushing forth. At the dawn of uh, the 19th century, uh, the best estimates attest to approximately 1,400 Native Americans living in the greater Wenatchee Valley. These Indians were decimated by smallpox and measles recurrently from, 18, from 1792, 1793, uh, all the way up through the 1820s. A depopulation in this area probably of uh, 60 to 70 percent. Entire villages uh, were, left, uh, were, were left virtually uh, deserted. In 1855, when Governor Isaac Stevens summoned the tribes living in the vast eastern half of Washington Territory for a treaty council, he referred to them all as children of the great white father, the president of the U.S., Franklin Pierce. They were regal families. They were not altogether of this world. In their mythology, they had uh, come from the star world. They maintained a certain uh, air of dignity about them, and uh, they were not to be spoken to as if they were children. In order to secure land for the railroad, Stevens needed to move all of the Indians onto two reservations, the Nez Perce and the Yakima. Stevens was a dreamer. Uh, he was brilliant, uh, he was ambitious, he could also be ruthless, uh, but he recognized the whole sense of the significance of Pacific Rim trade in the context of the world economy 
long before it came, became a, a catchword here in, in our generation. But the Wenatchee tribe refused to budge from their sacred fishery. If Stevens was expecting a, a quick signing to this great plan he had, he was deeply disappointed because the response that he did get was extremely frustrating to him because while he's speaking in very concrete terms, we've got the land to be surveyed, we're going to divide it in these ways, uh, we have dollars to pay you for the expenses of relocation, uh, we have these kinds of timelines. He's looking at this in extremely pragmatic terms. The answer he gets is, I wonder what the earth has to say about what we are talking about. To placate the Wenatchees, Stevens made an addition to the treaty. That addition, Article 10, established a reservation of 23,000 acres at the forks of the Wenatchee and Icicle Rivers. In the treaty uh, that was ratified by Congress, soon afterward, uh, Article 10 specifically refers to the uh, designation of the Wenatchipum Fisheries Reservation. So the Wenatchee people uh, uh, under Tekolakan and others left probably feeling that um, their, their beautiful fisheries and this land that they had inhabited for so many generations uh, would be theirs uh, in perpetuity. Unfortunately, the United States did not actually survey the reservation and remove it from the public domain. So uh, they did not have the reservation guaranteed for their use. And this was just uh, the first, one of the first instances of the United States neglect of their rights and the United States neglect of its obligations under the treaty. In the treaty which our people made with the United States, the United States promised to be friendly to us, to protect us always and to see that no wrong was done to us. It promised that we should have this land as long as the grass grew and the water ran, and that the strong arm of the government is still strong. We need protection which you promised us. You have not given it to us. We ask you why this is so. Nowadays, the closest many Wenatchees come to their original homeland is during this annual powwow, held at a little-used county park in Kashmir, along the banks of the Wenatchee River. <laughs> Tribes from throughout the central plateau gather for three days of dancing, singing, and games. <laughs> This park sits on a part of the Wenatchee's traditional homeland. The county has nearly abandoned it and the tribe has offered to lease and run it. But among the non-Indian population, there is opposition to Wenatchee's running the park and suspicion of the tribe's claim for their treaty rights. They think that we're wanting to come back into the valley to do like the smoke shops or the casinos. To me, it's not so much how much money are we going to make or what are we going to get out of it? This is where our, our parents, our grandparents, they were uh, born and raised in this area. These games, called stick games, are mysterious to an outsider but they've been played by Indians across the continent for centuries. To me, uh, it's very, land is very important our, in our way of life. It hurts that I read all of the records and see how 
how our ancestors were just pushed and pushed and sometimes killed for their land. While the Indians are holding their powwow, this parade, a celebration of the agriculture and history of the Wenatchee Valley, runs through downtown Kashmir, just a few miles away. There are no Indians in the procession. Although whites have lived in the valley for 130 years, have irrigated the fields, and established orchards and thriving businesses, and raised families of their own, to many Wenatchees, they represent the Europeans, the outsiders, who first came to this region in the 1870s. We were in the way, in the way of development, in the way of miners, in the way of people that wanted to have their ranches and their cattle and farms there. As, as I grew older and understood basically what um, was happening was, was that that was the intent of the United States government was to um, assimilate Native American into the European way of life. Everything was taken away. European people had no problem because Indian people would cease to exist. As a result of white incursions into the lands of the Plateau tribes, a war between the tribes and the United States raged between 1855 and 1858. But the Wenatchees abided by the terms of the treaty that established their reservation and remained at peace with the United States, even protecting whites in the area. The first white settlers to move into the Wenatchee Valley were farmers, trappers, and lumbermen. They built homes, schools, churches, and businesses. Soon, they began encroaching on Wenatchee land. The tribe didn't know that the Wenatchipam fishery had never been surveyed, that officials in Washington had ignored their obligations to actually set aside the lands. To a Wenatchee, Land didn't exist on paper anyway. They were supposed to uh, mark it off, but that never got marked. They moved it to another place. So there's so many different places that we don't know the real true boundaries. Our heritage and our culture does not say that we can own land. We, we, we love our land, we think we're part of the land. We, uh, we're not only us, but everybody is part of the land. We fit into it, but we, we can't buy and sell it. Our land and our religion is very important. It's all intertwined. Uh, our, our, spirits, our spirits are with the land. You lost part of you. you. You lost your home. You lost your land. But the way that I was brought up from my family is that you do not sell your land. Everything comes from this earth, everything we have. It's nourished. This earth drinks that water. Our mother takes the water and drinks it. And then we get the grass, we get the trees, we get the roots and the berries. It's not just given for nothing. This is the land where the Wenatchees now live a reservation located in the dry center of Washington state, bordered to the south and east by the Columbia River. This area is the aboriginal home of the Nespelem tribe, who along with the Wenatchees, the Entiat, the Chelan, the Metau, and six other tribes, make up the confederated tribes of Colville. It is here where Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce is buried. I feel like, almost like uh, Joseph did when he probably felt when he was shipped to Oklahoma. I don't feel I belong here on a Colville. Uh, I'm a kind of a foreigner like the non-Indians are in the United States. I feel like that here in the valley of Nespelem. This is Nespelem's land. This is where their ancestors died. This is where they're buried. This is where they lived. So all these things around here mean something to another tribe. 
I want to go back to Wenatchee. I want to stay there. I want to, I want to die there. I want to go home. My mother, I remember she used to have tears in her eyes when she tells us stories about the Wenatchee Valley because she couldn't go back there. I can go back to Wenatchee by land, but I, I have to live like the white man then. It's not like the same as going back to your homeland. Back in, uh, in, in, in Wenatchee where John Harmelt lived, he had a creek running alongside of his place, green grass year round, had had a, had a big mountain behind him where he ranged his horses every, every year. This land on the Colville Reservation was allotted to John Harmelt by the federal government, land that Harmelt didn't want and never set foot on. I, I think it was back probably in the 1960s when my mother finally began telling at least me the story about, about the Wenatchee fisheries. And I think she'd done it for a reason. I think she could see that I was probably going to end up in tribal politics. And, and, and so she wanted to start prepping me for, to, to be able to carry on the work that John Harmelt was doing. I, I think it was a wrong that was done to the Wenatchee people a long time ago. But uh, then again, it's a promise that I made my mother about the last probably 20 years of her life. I can't see why we have to fight for something that's already ours should be ours. We have to go to court to fight for those rights. But it's, I guess it's better than going on a war path like they used to do. At least 800 Wenatchee Indians were living near the Wenatchapam fishery in 1855. By 1892, disease had reduced the population to less than 400. During that entire period, they were peaceful and for the most part had very little contact with whites. Many of them tried to take advantage of the Indian Homestead Act of 1875, which allowed them to file for and protect individual plots of land on or near their traditional villages. But local officials charged them illegal fees for filing. It made no sense to the Wenatchees to have to pay for lands legally protected by Article 10 of the 1855 Treaty. At least 15 Wenatchees did file for homesteads, but those that received them had them stolen away. As with so many areas throughout the West, the arrival of the railroad played a fateful role in the future of the Wenatchee homeland. Construction of what would become the Great Northern Railroad began in 1886 in St. Louis, Missouri. In 1889, engineers in Washington scouted what they determined to be the most efficient route over the Cascade Mountains and into the western ports of Seattle and Tacoma. That route passed directly through the Wenatchapam fishery. The uh, surveyors for the Great Northern uh, Railroad coming down here through uh, the Wenatchee Valley uh, east of Stevens Pass were informed by the uh, leaders of uh, the Wenatchee people here that in fact this land had been designated for their exclusive use uh, under the terms of the 1855 treaty. And uh, the surveyors uh, doubtless consulted uh, their maps of the region. Um, it did not show such a reservation. By 1890, the Wenatchees knew that the survey promised them in the 1855 treaty had never been done. But their life along the fishery was continuing much as it always had, peaceful and uncontested. With the threat of the coming railroad, they realized they could no longer ignore the situation.
In the late fall of 1892, an Indian agent, acting on the tribe's behalf, asked permission from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs to map the boundaries of the fishery so that it might be properly surveyed. This preliminary map incorrectly located the Wenatchipam Reservation too far upstream, but it did, at least, include some of the original fishery. Based on this map, a deputy surveyor was dispatched acting under an executive order signed by President Benjamin Harrison to legally survey the reservation. The Indians felt that finally their reservation would be properly surveyed and protected. My father said this is our reservation. Of course, we Indians cannot do anything with the whites. We are afraid of them. Last year, a paper came and said the Wenatchapam Reservation will be renewed. All the Indians were glad. We thought we could find our country now. Crews worked throughout the winter to finish the railroad. And in January of 1893, the final spike was driven that connected the rails to the west coast. The Great Northern was completed and ready to roll. But railroad officials had never bothered to obtain the permission to build across Wenatchee lands. By the time the reservation survey began, Grover Cleveland was now president, and a new Indian agent was installed. This agent, L.T. Irwin, took one look at the survey of the Wenatchee Reservation and realized something was wrong. This line ran across the railroad, and as the department had instructed that the land be so located as to interfere with as few settlers as possible, we deemed it the best thing that could be done to change the line. Disregarding his instructions to correctly locate the boundaries of the reservation, Irwin ordered all survey markers destroyed and the reservation to be moved 10 miles upstream, far from where he knew it was supposed to be. You will discontinue your present survey of the Wenatchapan Fishery Reserve and begin at a point westerly by meanders the shore of the Lake Wenatchee, one mile from where the Wenatchee River leaves the same. This new reservation was now placed 25 miles up the Wenatchee River, far from the ancestral fishery the Wenatchees had called home for centuries. Of course, Irwin fraudulently moved the reservation from where it was supposed to be. The Secretary of the Interior ordered that the reservation be surveyed in the proper location, and Irwin came out and ordered the survey discontinued and moved the survey in a, into an area that was completely inappropriate. So uh, the Wenatchees knew immediately that this was not a place that they would accept. It was way up in the mountains. It was a place where there's deep snow and there's no agricultural land. There, there, are, no, there are almost no salmon make it up that high. So it was an area where there was no way they could survive. If they were put up there, they would, they would die. John Harmelt, quoting a Wenatchee elder, made an eloquent plea to stay on their original homeland. Does our great father think that a salmon is an eagle that lives on top of a mountain? Or does he think a salmon is a deer that lives in the woods and hills? The salmon is a mountain goat that lives among the rocks of the snow-covered mountains. Tell our great father the Indian does not care for the little trout in the lake, but wants the salmon that lives in the rocky places in the river where the Indians can find him. Our fisheries in the river where you saw it. It was destroyed by white men and the Indians driven away. We want our fishery in the river, where Governor Stevens gave it to us a long time ago. Fishing for the salmon is a spiritual experience. Having that taken away from me, I definitely feel that there is a void. This was the very crucial part of our, our Indian ways, was our food, is how we lived and we had to have these, uh, the salmon 
people used to use uh, dried salmon for trading, trading for a lot of stuff. The salmon and the land go together. People used to trade for blankets, for robes, uh, for beadwork. Chief John Harmelt protested to Agent Irwin about the placement of the reservation, but Irwin lied and said that he had nothing to do with it. I can say to you truthfully today that I don't think the fishery is properly located, but I have no power or authority to change the location. All I could do was see that it was properly surveyed. Major L.T. Irwin was a dishonest man. He was devious and he wove a web of deceit, uh, and his, every time he spoke, practically, it was a mixture of lies uh, and truths uh, in an effort to cover what he was doing. On the 11th, I went to superintend the survey of the Wenatchapam fishery. While I was engaged in this work, I was visited by quite a number of Wenatchapam Indians protesting against the location of the fishery at Lake Wenatchee and claiming that it was improperly located, that it should be further down the river. As I had no discretion to change the location, it has caused much dissatisfaction. Irwin created a plan to eliminate the Indians from having any reservation. First of all, he had the reservation surveyed in the mountains where he knew and must have been completely aware that the Indians would not accept it. In fact, he was aware because they told him so. And then he went to the Akamas and he went to the Wenatchees and said, you only have two choices. You can accept this reservation or you can be paid for it. Of course, this wasn't the truth. Those weren't the only two choices they had. They could have demanded uh, to have the reservation re-surveyed in the proper location, which the Surveyor General actually uh, indicated later on. But the Indians had no way of knowing that he was lying to them. In December of 1893, Chief Harmelt and a small band of Wenatchees traveled over mountains through deep snow to Fort Simcoe to attend a session council. A meeting was called by Agent Irwin to get the Wenatchees to sell the reservation. I cannot steal money from the government. The land does not belong to us and we have no right to sell it. The Yakima Indians, some of whom may have fished at the Wenatchapam fishery, told Irwin they would defer to the Wenatchees in any attempt to sell the Wenatchapam. Since Chief Harmelt was refusing to give in, Irwin instead offered a compromise. He said if they would give up the reservation near Lake Wenatchee, they would receive allotments of up to 160 acres along the banks of the Wenatchee River, and they would retain their fishing rights. You told me last summer that you and your people would not have that fishery on Lake Wenatchee, that you wanted your lands below the icicle. Now the government in Washington wants to fix it so that you and your people will be satisfied. The proposal guaranteed the Wenatchees ownership of the land where their ancestral fishery was. This pleased Harmelt, but he needed to discuss the idea with his people first. He left the council meeting with a promise from Irwin that they would meet again later to receive the allotments. You have shown me that I can take land where I now live. That went to my heart and I feel good about it. But the Indians over at Wenatchee need to hear your statements here today. Then they would decide on this land. Agent Irwin adjourned the session council. When he called the council together again on January 6, 1894, the Wenatchees were not invited. Only the Yakima tribe was present. After promising them that the Wenatchees would receive their allotments, Irwin convinced the Yakimas to sell the Wenatchapam fishery for $20,000. Among the Yakima people, uh, they were presented essentially with a fait accompli. They, they, would, they would lose all hope of any recompense whatsoever because the land had been heavily claimed already by uh, white settlers. And uh, so in the discussion of the matter, they were assured by uh, Indian agent Irwin on the Yakima uh, reservation that uh, in fact the rights of these Wenatchee people would be respected. 
The reason why the Wenatchees cannot fish at the Wenatchipan fishery and the Yakimas can today is because of a ruling of a judge in a case called United States versus Oregon. In that case, the judge ruled that the Yakimas were a treaty tribe and entitled to fish at their usual and custom places, and that the Wenatchees, as part of the Colville Reservation, were not a treaty tribe. In fact, Agent Irwin was continuing a deception that began when he first moved the Wenatchee Reservation in 1893. He changed its location. He lied to the Indians about their need to surrender their legal right to it. He induced the Yakimas to sell the reservation. And in the final act of fraud, Irwin then failed to make a single allotment of the land he promised to the Wenatchees. There was never uh, an intent. Uh, if, if there was an intent, it was never followed through to allot them 20,000 acres of land. He then lied to the Wenatchees, lied to the Yakimas, uh, even lied to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Uh, there was a handful of allotments made. And allow whites to, white squatters to homestead there. Uh, all the rest of the band was essentially uh, forced to relocate to uh, area reservations, principally to the Colville Reservation. And allowed the railroad free reign uh, in building its tracks through the area. And a few uh, real stalwarts like Chief Harmelt and others uh, decided they would never relocate, and they remained here for the rest of their lives. The Wenatchees must have felt in the ensuing years that uh, through his acts, he had destroyed uh, all of the promises that the United States had made to them. The people that knowingly uh, took the land from our people uh, with the knowledge that our people did not read or write or understand what was happening. A few months after the reservation was sold, in order to justify his deception, Agent Irwin tried to give each Wenatchee Indian a sum of $9.30. This sum represented what would have been their share of the $20,000 for which the reservation was sold. When Chief Harmelt refused to be bought off, he was taken to a nearby stable where Irwin tried to force the money on him. The agent said he wanted me to take the money, and I said, nothing doing. I'm not going to sell my rights. After my telling him no, they pushed the money right in my face. Now that I know what they were up to, I think I would slap his face. <laughs> But then, he was a big government man. That's all I have to say about it. I have said nothing but the truth. I was surprised to find that the Indians were unwilling to accept these terms. They said they would not accept a dollar of money unless they could get it all. Nor would they accept lands other than that along the Wenatchee River, which are now occupied by white settlers. Our reservation appears to have been sold in 1894. Now the Great Northern Railroad, which runs down our valley, claims our land. And many white settlers are in our reservation, have fenced up our fields and claim that the land belongs to them. This leaves no land for our children. And in many cases, the railroad company has sold the land which has been occupied by members of our tribe for many years. And white men have gone upon these lands and put the Indians out of possession. Where do we belong? And what have we done? The advancement of civilization has changed the state of affairs entirely. This section is settled by the whites. All the inducements that once attached the Indians to this section have departed. We never had one cent of government money at any time. We never had a war with the government nor cost the government a cent. There are over 200 of us who have lived in one place always so far as we know. Will you kindly tell us what to do? With scarcely anything to wear, with starvation, staring them in the face, these Indians refused to accept a cent or give me a single name so that new lands could be allotted to them. 
the money is ready for them, but they will not take it. They say, we are the original settlers, and we want the land reserved for us along the Wenatchapam River. This is land already settled by the whites. They are the most remarkable people I ever met. Three years later, in 1897, a sympathetic Indian inspector by the name of W.J. McConnell heard the story of what happened to the Wenatchapam Reservation. He wrote an angry letter demanding that the U.S. government be held accountable for the tragedy. Are we a nation of thieves and unmitigated scoundrels? Will the interest of private individuals or the greed of corporations be allowed to sully our nation's honor? Must men like myself, who assisted in redeeming the wilderness and who are today powerless to undo the wrongs which were parsley of our doing, bow our heads in humiliation at the recital of the falsity of the promises we have made? They took all our land, promised us so much, and told us, you move there, and you'll have a nice place at least, you know, you'll get some farm tools and all that stuff, but, you know, that only lasted, you know, maybe a year. Then everything was forgotten. You know, who cares? You know, they're just dumb Indians. With the reservation now lost, Harmelt and other Wenatchee leaders continued to protest the loss of their land and rights. Many Wenatchees began to move to the Colville Reservation. They thought at least there they were safe from the encroachment of whites. My name is Georgia Ukes. I um, um, come from the Wenatchee Chelan Indian Band. And I'm 76 years old. Lived here all my life. Columbus wasn't the first. He didn't discover this land. We discovered this land. The Creator let us discover this land. So, rightfully, the whole country is Indian country. I don't care where you stand, still Indian country. I don't care where you sat, that's still Indian country. But because of the government, we now have to abide by what they let us have, which is very little. I don't have good feelings towards the government for abusing our land because we roamed this country freely, clear up to the Missouri River, our people roamed. When the Wenatchees moved to this reservation, the Columbia River was still rich with enough salmon to feed every tribe in the area. Although the Wenatchees had lost their aboriginal fishing grounds, they could still harvest their most important food source. But the river that provided one of the most abundant supplies of salmon in the world was also providing something else. When the Grand Coulee Dam was built between 1934 and 1941, it electrified communities across the state. Rural towns became prosperous. Cities were provided with a seemingly endless store of cheap power. But by 1939, the rich salmon runs were completely and permanently destroyed by the dam. Before the land was uh, changed, like this dam built here, you had free-flowing river. You can picture the river coming down. You can see trees on both sides. But now you can't see that. You see something big, lifeless. It's a big, lifeless thing that's floating across, stopping. 
what I consider is life flowing water. I have not really been able to touch, I guess, my ancestry in, in that respect. I have not been able to experience what my ancestors had once experienced. Like many yeah, tribal is, members, yeah, to Tony Atkins is deeply aware of the importance of maintaining a connection to their traditional past. <laughs> These classes teach the Wenatchee language to a whole new generation of tribal members. It isn't easy. These children have to learn a different way of making their tongues move. Georgia Ayux is there as well, relearning the language she can barely remember. The Indian, they stop and listen. They give thanks and say, that is a good bush of berries. That is a good tree up there. That will give me a good teepee pole for the winter. The younger generation know the history of the Wenatchipam fishery. 26-year-old Dana Cleveland supports the struggle to get their rights restored. Yet he's also grounded right here, on the Colville Reservation, the only home he's ever known. This land has fed my family and myself. You want to be a hunter? Part of Dana's ancestry is from tribes to the west huh? of the Cascades. He hopes his son will appreciate the Wenatchee's vital place in the history of the region. The very, to me, most basic of human needs is place. There are some spiritual connections here now. You know, we, we established it just by being here. The, the things we learned when we were little, you know, the sweats, the dances, songs. You know, and just, just by being out here, being part of the land, you know, it, uh, the connections are, are made, you know, and they're strong. Here in Nespilam, the Colville tribes suffer from the same problems as do many Indian people. Unemployment, drug and alcohol addiction, depression, bitterness. Although they have suffered many decades of poverty on the reservation, today the tribe's people find jobs logging and milling the timber on their land. And they work in their small casinos, which help to draw tourists to the area and provide the tribe with some revenue. But the Wenatchees are not a wealthy tribe, and the reservation is too remote and too barren to be rich either in trees or tourism. The only way that we're able to survive is to be, become educated, to understand the law, to, to interpret law. I think that's the only way that we're going to get our, our rights back. The original Wenatchee Reservation is now the site of Leavenworth, Washington, a small but busy tourist stopover. Up until the mid-60s, Leavenworth was a railroad town, inching toward the edge of extinction until the city fathers decided to remake it into a Bavarian village. Although the native roots and berries were mostly plowed under by the turn of the century, in 1905, 36% of the Wenatchee's ancestral grounds was still public land and available to be allotted to the tribe. But the government again failed in its promise to provide allotments to the Wenatchees. Today, 28% of that public land, over 11,000 acres, is still available. By the 1920s, most of the Wenatchees still living in the valley were so poor, hungry, and sick that they were forced to move to the Colville Reservation. But Harmelt and his family remained. Chief John Harmelt stayed in the Wenatchee area on an allotment in this valley, 15 miles away from the fishery. He was a, a strong person, but he, he had uh, bitter feelings. He fought a lot of battles with his mind instead of the bow and arrow. He knew what he wanted for his people, and it was always for the people that he wanted it. 
John Hormel was out there like the Lone Ranger, all by himself in the middle of the sea on a little island trying to fight off all these things. There, there wasn't a day in their lives that they didn't think about the, the, the beautiful land that always should have been theirs. When the United States makes fundamental guarantees and promises to some of its people, it's important to all of us that those guarantees and those promises are kept. The lands here have been grown open, settled by whites, which leaves me alone. And subject to white laws, usages, and customs which I don't understand. All living relatives except my mother are on the reservation. In 1931, Chief Harmelt presided over a grand powwow held in Kashmir. The Wenatchees once again aired their grievances, but this time they decided to hire an attorney to pursue their claims against the government. A non-Indian lawyer, Frederick Kemp, filed a statement and petition of the Wenatchipam Indians, signed by leaders of the tribe, and sent to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. The purported consent to the sale of this Wenatchee fishery at a tribal meeting at Yakima was a pure fraud on the Wenatchee Indians, to whom this fishery right in the township reservation was of special benefit. At first, the Indian office seemed to support the Wenatchee's claims, suggesting they sign a contract with Attorney Kemp so he could begin working for them. But two years later, in 1935, a newly appointed Indian commissioner had the contract killed, probably for political reasons. Frankly, in my opinion, the government itself should have investigated this claim of the Indians by its own special agents and investigators many years ago and made restitution for these Wenatchee Indians for the government was a party of the fraud that was practiced on them. One evening, two years after the contract was dropped, a fire started in the small wood house where John Harmelt lived with his wife Ellen. The flames grew out of control while they slept. Both perished. It was the 4th of July, 1937. When Chief John Harmelt died, the Wenatchee claims against the United States government may have seemed to have died with him. Following Harmelt's death, his granddaughter was forced to move with her husband and children to the Colville Reservation. There, she continued to pass along the story of her grandfather's fight for recognition. We know her spirit's with us yet. She's still around here. She's still watching over us, even though she's gone to another world. She always made sure that we knew where we came from and who we were. In the treaty which our people made with the United States, the United States promised to be friendly with us to protect us always and to see that no wrong was done to us. It, it promised that we should have this land as long as the grass grew and the water ran. <laughs> 